So I told you in the last uh, video that there are a few um, paradigms, a few organizing concepts that are used in anatomy and physiology. One of them was the levels of organization. Another one you might hear about in anatomy lab that uh, structure um, is determined by function. Um, and the third one is this one, homeostasis or negative feedback loops. Homeostasis or negative feedback loops is a concept you can trust yourself to understand it intuitively. So if my description starts to get a little bit in the weeds, uh, maybe, maybe go back to reading the textbook. So homeostasis, um, everything that is going to keep you alive uh, needs to keep every one of your cells alive. So life on planet Earth, it evolved originally in oceans, we think. And originally we were a single cell floating in the ocean. And the ocean is a very, very, very stable environment. The amount of salt in any given square mile of ocean is very constant, not just from day to day, but even from, from one month to another. Uh, the temperature of the water, once you're a few feet down, very constant. Um, the pH of the environment, very, very constant. Uh, so that is a happy situation for life. Well, we don't live that way anymore. We're humans, we're walking around up here on top of planet Earth. So we have to carry this constancy with us. We need to make it so that the amount of salt in our body and in our bloodstream, not too much, not too little, just right, that the acidity, the pH of our fluids, not too acid, not too basic, just right. Um, the temperature, not too hot, not too cold, just right. All of, all of these many, many parameters need to be kept into what I call the Goldilocks zone. And that Goldilocks zone, not too much, not too little, just right, that is homeostasis, the state of dynamic constancy. Is our body temperature always 98.6? No but it shouldn't be 102 and it shouldn't be 95, right? It should be in this little zone of normal. And keeping it there is the job of most of our physiology. Um, and our physiology relies on these negative feedback loops. I told you, you can trust yourself, right? Let's talk about air conditioning. It's probably warm when you're watching this. What makes your air conditioner turn on? Well, your air conditioner is going to turn on when the thermostat in the house measures, senses that the temperature in your house is too high. And when that happens, the thermostat will send a signal to the air conditioner and turn it on. Does the air conditioner stay on for forever? Once it's turned on, do you have to go turn it off by hand? No, you don't turn it off by hand because the air conditioner will turn off when the thermostat measures that the temperature in the house has come down into the Goldilocks zone and then it'll turn itself off. That's a negative feedback loop. Something gets turned on, it causes an effect. When that effect has been achieved, it gets turned off. So here's an example in humans. What makes you shiver? What makes you shiver is your hypothalamus. It is measuring that your body temperature is too cold. And when your body temperature is too cold, the hypothalamus will make you start to shiver. When you shiver, all of your muscles are contracting. Muscle contraction generates heat. And when that heat builds up, it brings your body temperature back into the normal range. And then your hypothalamus senses that and it turns off the shivering, okay? It is not more complicated than that. Now, this image is in your textbook, um, and I think sometimes the image just seems daunting, but remember, you can trust yourself on this, right? There are all kinds of receptors in all kinds of areas of your body. We've been talking about body temperature. There's a part of your body in your brain, the hypothalamus, that is busy measuring what your body temperature is. If your body temperature is too cold, it causes you to shiver. If your body temperature is too warm, maybe because you're exercising on a warm day, then it is going to say, hey, this is not my set point. 
this temperature is too warm, I am going to cause the, mus the body to sweat. And then your sweat glands will release sweat. And when the sweat evaporates off your skin, it is going to uh, cause you to cool down. And when you cool back down, then your hypothalamus goes, okay, we've cooled back down. We can stop sweating, right? So not more complicated than that. Great. So now we are going to move into uh, chemistry. There's my little anime guy saying, oh, no, why are we studying chemistry? Um, because life is chemistry, right? Um, a lot of you are interested in medicine. If you're not interested in medicine, you certainly have been benefited by medicine. How does medicine work? How does an aspirin make your headache go away? A Tylenol or an aspirin is made out of chemicals. Those chemicals are molecules that were made out of atoms and they dissolve in your bloodstream because of their chemical nature. And then they are going to travel all around your body and when they get to certain cells of your body, they are going to bind to chemicals inside of them or on the surface. And by binding to those other chemicals, those other molecules, that's gonna make your headache go away. Um, all of life is chemicals. Now, um, before we go too far, for those of you who know chemistry, let me apologize to you because I am not a chemist. I'm a biologist and we've got a pretty simple way of looking at life. For example, we really are only thinking about the smallest of the atoms because it's the smallest of the atoms that make life possible. And I also will be talking to you about the structure of atoms more like you learned in fifth grade and not at all like you would have learned in college chemistry. But we'll talk about it that way. Okay. So first of all, an atom. Atoms are the smallest unit of matter that retain the properties of an element. Elements are those things on the periodic table. Iron is an element, oxygen is an element, helium, nitrogen, gold, silver. These are all elements. They are all substances that are made out of atoms that are all the same type of atom. Um, so atoms are the smallest unit of an element. And here we can see an atom, and this atom has got the basics we need to know. In the middle of an atom, there are subatomic particles called neutrons and protons. And whizzing around the outside of an atom, usually there are electrons. The center part of an atom is known as the nucleus. Nucleus, I, I don't know, maybe it's Greek for the word center, the center of an atom is called the nucleus. This is something way too small to be seen with even the most powerful light microscope. This word nucleus also describes the center of a cell. Okay, it's really easy to see the nucleus of a cell. So they just got the same name because it means center and in both cases it's the center of that thing, but they're not, a nucleus of an atom is different from the nucleus of a cell. So one of the first things you need to know is which subatomic particles are found in the nucleus of an atom. And the right answer is neutrons and protons. Which subatomic particle is not found in the nucleus? The electron, right? The next thing you need to know that some of these subatomic particles have what we call a charge. They have got an electrical nature I usually think of it as electricity, but I also sometimes think of it as the way magnets act, right? So in the nucleus, we have got protons. Protons are positively charged, okay? P for proton, P for positive. Protons are positively charged. As a matter of fact, every proton has got a charge that we call plus one. Every neutron that's in the nucleus, it is neutral. That's how it got its name, neutron, right? Electrons. Electrons are negatively charged. As a matter of fact, every electron has got a charge of minus one. 
Now, if we look at this very simple um, atom, this simple atom we're looking at, it's helium. And helium has got two protons in its nucleus. This one's got two neutrons in its nucleus. And it's got two electrons zipping around on the outside. If I were to ask you, what is the net charge of this atom? You might not know how to answer that, but let me walk you through it. The net charge. If I add up the pluses and the minuses, what does it add up to? Well, I have two pluses and two minuses. They cancel each other out. So the net charge for this particular atom would also be neutral. There is no net charge for this atom. Why? Whenever the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons, there will be no net charge. We'll talk about this a little bit more. All atoms have protons in the nucleus. Almost all atoms also have neutrons there. The nucleus is the atom's center part and the electrons whiz around on the outside. By the way, the way we've been drawing an atom, not, not to scale at all, okay? If the nucleus were the size of a peanut, and if we put that peanut in the center of a great big football stadium, not a high school one, but like a big professional football stadium, this layer of electrons would be way out at the cheap seats, okay? So this is not drawn to scale. All right, atomic structure, let's do a little survey. Protons have a positive charge, they're plus one. Electrons have a negative charge, they're minus one. So in every neutral atom, they will have the same number of protons as they have electrons, right? If an atom had an extra electron, then it would have an extra minus one, and it would have a charge of minus one, right? Atoms that have extra electrons or they're missing electrons, meaning if an atom has more electrons than it has protons, or if it has fewer electrons than it has protons, then it is becoming charged and it is called an ion, right? If an ion has got more electrons than protons, then it's a negatively charged ion. If an ion has got more protons than electrons, then it's a positively charged ion, right? So let's try this. What if an atom or a molecule has got nine protons but 10 electrons? Then it would be plus nine but minus 10. So its net charge would be minus one. It would become an atom, an ion, sorry. It would become an ion and it would be a minus one ion. Why? Plus nine minus one. I'm sorry, minus 10 ends up being my minus one. Okay, hold on. I'm going to try this. Let's try this. I'm going to draw with drawing. Okay, so plus nine minus 10 equals minus one. It would have a net charge of minus one, right? And so it would become an ion and a negatively charged ion. Oh, what else do you need to know? Well, we, we haven't really talked about elements yet. We will in a second. But an atom, we know what that is, made out of protons and electrons and usually also neutrons. Let's learn a couple of terms. The atomic number is the number of is the number of protons in the atom. So if I told you that I held in my hand um, an atom that had um, eight electrons and eight uh, protons, um, the atomic number for my atom would be eight. If I told you that I have an element that has an atomic number of 12, how many protons does it have? 
you would answer it has got 12, right? The atomic number is the same as the number of protons. By the way, the atomic number, the number of protons in the atom is what determines what element we are talking about. We will start here at the beginning of the next lecture. Uh, this is an element which is an atomic number of six. So it has got six protons in its nucleus. And every atom that has six protons in its nucleus is a carbon atom. This is a simplified periodic table. And we will start here at the beginning of our next lecture.